Hey, good morning. Welcome to Pine Level Baptist Church. You're visiting with us today, especially welcome you here today. Uh, I'd like to go over today's announcements here with you real quick. Um, I won't go over everything. Most of you right there that are viewing us from home uh, have already seen it go across your screen, but I will uh, go over just a few things right here. Um, WMU meeting uh, for you ladies right there on Monday, November the 1st at 7 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, we are again partnering with the Baptist Center to provide food boxes for the, during the holidays. The cost for each box is $25. Uh, if you'd like to contribute, please give your donation to Miss Onita or Miss Pat by November the 30th. And all, you know, everything is always appreciated right there. Uh, youth, remember Hearts on Fire. Uh, we'll be staying in the cabin right there. So for all you youth, we need to get a head count today. Uh, trunks of Treat, uh, Saturday, October the 30th, 6 to 8. On that day right there, if you are uh, setting up for uh, your trunk and stuff, if you can come about 5 o'clock to get set up uh, and grab a hot dog and uh, a little bit of snack and a little time to talk before everybody starts coming. So remember that on uh, next Saturday, October the 30th, uh, if you're setting up your trunk to be here at 5 o'clock, if you can, and uh, get set up and stuff. But it'll be from 6 to 8 right there. Uh, I've got a little flyer right here. Miss Stacy wanted me to show you uh, this right here. Grab this right here on your way out. Uh, it's also got a uh, registration form on the back of it right there, if you don't mind to fill that out for her. Uh, let's see, Sunday morning prayer room is Amy Waters. We'll be in her prayer room today. Uh, so if you'd like to text a prayer request over to her during service, uh, her phone number, 865-659-5147. Miss Amy Waters, 865-659-5147. Appreciate her being back there today. Uh, also remember Operation Christmas Child. There are boxes out there that are available in the vestibule on your way out. Uh, you'll also find a list of what is needed in each box. Uh, fill the boxes uh, we do by November the 14th. If you prefer to make a donation, you can do that. I'd uh, be happy to purchase those items for you. You can see Ms. Stacy Overholt or Ms. Onita McCauley on that right there. Um, also, our discipleship small groups are back in session. If you don't already know that right there, uh, please remember those things right there. We have two groups meeting at the church, Sundays at 4.30 with Chris McInnes, and Wednesdays at 10 a.m. with Ms. Carol Coulter, and one group meeting virtually using Zoom Tuesdays at 7 p.m. with Ms. Melanie Effler. Anything else needs to be going over? I feel like I kind of went over it pretty quick. I was trying to rush up here right fast. Good looking crowd. May God bless you all. We're here in the middle of Puerto Santa Ana in Ecuador, close to the Amazon. Kids are receiving the shoebox for the very first time in their lives. Gracias por empacar las cajitas de regalo. Gracias por orar por estos niños. When I was 10 years old, I received an Operation Christmas Child shoebox in my hometown, Ambato, Ecuador. I remember my favorite thing in that box. It was like this black jacket, super cool, that I was wearing until I turned 16, I think. <laughs> I understand when I received the shoebox that God was taking care of me in a particular way. He was putting his eyes on me. When I understood that, I just felt that I needed to give something back. So after I, I received my shoebox, I, I decided that I want to do something, but I was not a, a, a preacher back those days. I was Stan. <laughs> so the, the easy way was become a clown. <laughs> so I was a clown. I used to do a lot of puppets and those kind of stuff, uh, trying to just share the gospel with the shoeboxes and all those things. When you understand that God could call anyone, but He decided to call you, <laughs> it makes me feel like I need to do my greatest and just put all my energy as the people that were part of the party that I was in when I was 10. I want to be the same thing now. <laughs> I want to give my all my energy because you never know 
who around all of those children are becoming pastors, are becoming servants. We're not just giving gifts to the children. We are opening doors for them to understand that God has an entire life for them. God has a plan with every single children that is receiving this shoebox. Today, I have the privilege to be the senior pastor in the Hechos 29 Church in Ambato, Ecuador. This simple shoebox gave me the chance to see my great father loves for me. And now that's the reason that all Sunday mornings, I'm so excited to, to go to the church and share the gospel and, and, and preach. It gave me the chance to see that there are many people just like me that are in need Maybe just of a hack or just to hurt that Jesus loved them. And now I'm able to do that because someone just heard God's voice and put a black jacket on my shoebox. Man, it's just so crazy that people are just so willing to give something from themselves. But that is God. It's God working through people for other people. And for the ones that are packing shoe boxes, man, thank you very much. You are doing a huge, huge work just hearing God's voice. Well, as you uh, see that and understand the importance of it, and, and uh, she just walked in right now, Miss Stacy, did you not tell me that you have committed us to 175 shoe boxes this year? So, okay. Uh, so we did 150 last year. She has told them that Piney Level could easily do 175. So let's, uh, let's not make Kendall have to go out and buy 150 boxes at the, <laughs> in, in a couple. Uh, so uh, let's get on board and, and do this. And you see the impact that it has. And you know, and, and it's just good to be in the Lord's house today and looking forward to all that He is doing, continues to do. And as we have our Mission Emphasis Month today, we're going to be uh, traveling to Kenya. So I'm going to uh, step aside and have Miss Katie step up here. And she's going to tell you about some opportunities that we have to partner with ministries there. And as many of you all know, probably a lot of the, the Piney Level has been all about the kids from there. Well, this goes to a different level uh, than just the children in Kenya. So uh, let's uh, you pay attention and see what the Katie has for us here. Good morning. I am just going to try to be brief. Um, I could talk about this for probably the entire day, but I won't do that. Um, I wish we were actually traveling to Kenya. Maybe we can make that happen soon. Um, but I'll just talk to you real quick about Thrift for Kenya. Um, that's a project that I started back in 2018. Um, me and my mom and my grandma had just gotten back from Kenya for the first time. Mom's mistake because now I'm hooked and she doesn't want me to move there, but I will as soon as Gabe agrees. Um, so I started that as a way to raise money to go back to Kenya. That was my main focus when I got back after that two-week trip. I was like, how can I raise enough money to get me and Gabe to Kenya next summer? So I got on my Instagram and I started asking different questions of what people would want to support, bake sales, different ideas. And one idea that I had was to buy thrifted clothes from the thrift store and resell them for a little bit more money and use that money to pay for my trip. When I was in high school, I wear clothes that are mostly from the thrift store, as you can see by my outfit today. And a lot of people were like, where could you, where'd you get that? Where can I get that? And I'm like, sorry, one of a kind, got it from the thrift store. So I decided to use that to um, let people get the clothes that they wanted from the thrift store, but I was also able to raise money for Kenya. Um, so I went to the thrift store. A lot of people said that they would like that idea. So I was like, okay, let's give it a shot. So I went to the thrift store and I bought an absurd amount of clothing um, to the point that they looked at me like I was crazy. And uh, I took it home. I'd had Emma try it all on for me, took pictures of it, posted it all on Instagram. And that 
all sold within the day. I think we sold like 50 clothing items on the first day. So I realized maybe I'm onto something here. So I started doing that uh, as much as I could. At, at one point, they just started pulling out the big garbage bags when I walked into the thrift store. They didn't even question me anymore. Um, so I did that for a while and pretty much sold all the clothes that I bought. Uh, it worked really well. And that was able to raise, I don't know how much exactly, but it was enough to pay for me and Gabe, our flights to and from Kenya, our stay, our food in Kenya for a month. We also gave some money towards Julie's trip, we gave some money for our friend Corey's trip, and we gave some money while we were in Kenya to different projects there. So several thousand dollars that we were able to raise doing that. So when we went to Kenya for a month, we came back, me and Gabe got engaged, we got married that same year, so Thrift for Kenya was kind of on pause. Um, we got married at the end of 2019, and at the beginning of 2020, I was like, ooh, maybe I'll start up Thrift for Kenya again, except the pandemic came and all the thrift stores shut down. So I had to pivot and figure out what else I could do. Um, so I had seen somewhere on Pinterest about making clay earrings out of polymer clay. And I was like, you know, I could give that a shot. So I did. They weren't very good, but people were still really gracious and bought them anyway. And I realized I could raise money doing clay earrings. I wouldn't have to go to the thrift store. So during the pandemic, I started making clay earrings, sold those on Instagram, and was raising about the same amount of money. So um, I kept making clay earrings because the thrift stores were shut down for a long time. And eventually that caught on quicker than the clothes did. So I kept making clay earrings um, as often as I could. I remember the first time we did it, I think we sent over about $500 to Kenya, and that was a big deal um, because there was no trips in the future with the pandemic. We didn't know when we were going to get to go back. So we just decided to start using the money we were raising to do different projects in Kenya. A lot of you met Tom. He runs the organization that brought all the kids from the choir here. So I partnered with him, and he was able to be in the ground in Kenya, or on the ground in Kenya, during the pandemic, it was really bad. I know like everywhere had it bad for the pandemic, but it was just excruciatingly bad in Kenya. The government is awful there. They don't give any support. There weren't stimulus checks going out to people. You basically, if you lived in the slums, you went from making $2 a day to $0 a day, because you didn't have any work. So people were starving. There were children. I mean, it was just awful. So we sent the money over and Tom used it to do feedings in the city, in the capital city of Nairobi. Um, I think the first time we bought like 25 bags of food and it was able to feed people for a month. So that was really cool. And as soon as we started doing that, that started to really catch on. People that were supporting Thrift for Kenya really liked that they were going to be supporting people directly in Kenya, in the city. Um, so people got really excited about that. Um, we kept doing that as much as I could. I did it, you know, every few months I would do earrings and we would send over money and we sent over a few thousand dollars in 2020. Well, when 2021 rolled around, towards March, I, um, after doing it pretty inconsistently, after doing earrings pretty inconsistently, um, I felt like God was calling me to more. I didn't know what that looked like. I didn't know what that was going to be like. You all know for pretty much all of 2020 and the first half of 2021, I wasn't at church because I was working a job that was pretty much draining the life out of me. But most of, most, of it was mostly because I wasn't able to be a part of my church family anymore. I was working every single Sunday. And um, I just felt like something was about to change in my spirit. I felt like God was telling me, like preparing me for something about to change. So I texted Miss Brenda <laughs> in March. I was just looking back at the text. I texted her in March for us to meet up. And we met up at the end of March. And I was telling her about it. And she said she was so excited for me. And she would be praying for me. And we prayed together. And if it wasn't like two weeks later, I got a random opportunity for another job, something that was completely different. I went from working retail at a five-star resort to working at a car auction with a bunch of old men. <laughs> But let me tell you, I love it. I absolutely love it. I, I never in a million years would have seen this coming. I now work part-time hours, and I'm only telling you this because it'll make sense as to why Thrift for Kenya has become what it is. So I went from working about 45 hours a week at BlackBerry to working about 28 hours a week making the same amount of money per week. So that was God basically just 
taking me out of this place that I really couldn't work on for, for Kenya and giving me this new opportunity um, for me to use a lot more time and really grow Thrift for Kenya into something consistent. So I was able to um, start this new job in May, and that's when I did my first earring drop, my first monthly earring drop in May. Um, as soon as I did that, things started to really pick up. The consistency really worked. We gained a lot of new followers, a lot of new people wanted to support Thrift for Kenya. Um, so we partnered with Tom again, and then this time we started working under Connect with a Child. So Thrift for Kenya, instead of just being this independent thing, has kind of started working under Connect, and Connect is a nonprofit organization, so now we're able to raise the money through a nonprofit, so everything's legal with the government and taxes and everything like that, which is really good, because we were raising too much money for it to be, um, not have some kind of like legal entity around it. Um, so we partnered with Tom at that point, and shortly after that, Tom said that as things were opening back up in Kenya, people in the city were getting more aid from you know, foreign people coming in and providing aid. There are just more opportunities in the city. When we were in Kenya, we did a lot of work in the village called Siaya, and Tom said that the women in Siaya, specifically the widows in Siaya, were having a really difficult time because there's nobody going there and providing aid. There's nobody going there and offering help of any kind. Um, so we decided to pivot from the city and we started to, uh, a monthly widow feeding in the village. So at that point, I realized if we're going to be doing this every month, we have to be really consistent about the money that we're raising. So I have started to do, since May, I've done a monthly drop of earrings, which is basically just I make a whole bunch of earrings and I post them all on Instagram. People buy them. They donate money for the cause, and I send them the earrings that they want. And um, the first time we did that, we raised over $1,000. That was in May, and we've consistently raised over $1,000 a month um, since then. I've done a drop from since May, so May, June, July, August, September, and October. Each one has been more successful than the last, um, and we are using that money to send over to Kenya, and our friends in Kenya are doing feedings in the village for the widows. So that's the heart of Thrift for Kenya at this point. Um, all of these widows are by themselves, they maybe are taking care of children or their grandchildren, but they don't have a husband, they don't have somebody to go out and work for them while they take care of the home. Um, so that's where we come in. We send about $700 a month over to our friends in Kenya, and they use that money to um, buy bags of food for these women that are in the village, these widows. Um, they really have no other help, so this is a big deal for them. Um, $700 buys us between 45 and 48 bags of food, depending on the prices in Kenya at that moment. So, so far since August, we've been providing bags of food for over 45 women every single month, and each bag lasts them through the next feeding. So they're never having to go without, they're never having to wonder how they're going to feed their families or how they're going to feed themselves. Um, they're able to have money, cons or have food consistently. Um, we've been doing that, and we plan on continuing that for a while, um, as long as we can, we can see it happening. Um, like I said, we've raised more than the $700 every month. We're, we're keeping it at the $700 for now to make sure that we're not sending $900 one month and only $600 the next. We want everybody to have food every single time. Probably at the beginning of the year, because we've been raising consistently over the $700, we'll probably raise it to $800 so we can give even more women bags of food consistently. Um, we're really excited about that. But basically, that's Thrift for Kenya. That's what we're doing right now. Um, there's quite a few ways if you want to help, to help. Um, you could buy earrings if you can beat Kat McInnes to them first, because she really likes to get them too. Um, you could buy earrings. You could just give money if you're not interested in earrings. Um, about $15 will buy a bag of food for a family for an entire month, which is not that much here, but $15 goes really far in Kenya. So you could just give money if you wanted to. Um, if you are getting rid of old clothes, let me look through them first before you take them to the donation store. And if I can use anything in Thrift for Kenya, I could sell them on Thrift for Kenya because we still do clothes every so often. 
um, that's a huge way that would, that would give a lot of help because I could sell the clothes and use that money for the bags of food as well. Um, but I think I've covered everything. I just want to read two Bible verses um, real quick. Isaiah 117 says, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, and plead the widow's cause. And James 127 says, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. And I'm gonna play a quick video real quick and then I'll pass it back over. That's a wonderful ministry and wonderful opportunities to, to be involved in that. And you can see how that God moves and God works. When we're willing, uh, God provides a way. God provides the means. And uh, uh, church, I, I do ask you to pray much, see how you can be involved in it. You know, we just, uh, our Christmas presents there, Larry, that you can buy. You know, use clothes and earrings. Uh, and, uh, but... Uh, <clears throat> You know, whatever, you know, whatever we need to do, you know, there to, to share the gospel. And then, of course, next week when we come back out here to the food pantry, Chris will be carrying boxes on top of his head like they were. Uh, I mean, it, it's amazing. But, to, you know, it's just a, a wonderful thing, though, to, to see that and just to hear them just, I mean, the joy uh, in their heart on just receiving just a bag of food. Uh, you know, we, we are so abundantly blessed. We just need to praise God and thank God. And do ask you just, as I said, another opportunity. in church, we're just presenting all these things. I know you can't be involved in everything, but we need to find out what God would have you to be involved in and do it. And uh, that's a very wonderful ministry right there. So do ask you to pray much today. Pray that God would just open our hearts to what He is doing because God's in control. God is uh, moving. Uh, uh, places in the world, God is at work, and we just need to praise Him and thank Him for that. I do ask you to pray for all of our sick. Continue to pray for Ted and Bill, and just there's several others that are really struggling with their health right now. Just pray that God would just help them, strengthen them uh, in this time. I uh, ask you to uh, pray for the service, you know, and just open your hearts to the worship. Here in just a moment, some of these young ladies there, and you know, Emma just gets used for everything. You know, she's a clothing model. She's a backup singer. So it's, a <laughs> yeah, she's useful. So, you know, let's just be useful uh, and uh, just praise God for that. But uh, join me as we pray today that God would open our hearts, that we would be obedient to his will and, and just to worship him and praise him today. I, I'd love nothing better than to see our people standing up. And, you know, you saw them swaying there. And, you know, why were they swaying? They, they were feeling what was in their heart. You know, we, we don't have to be so stoic. We can allow that joy to come out. I guarantee you last night when Tennessee was ahead for just a minute, uh, there, there were people, I mean, there were people going crazy, weren't they? Well, let me tell you something. Christ wins for eternity. 
Man, we ought to be we ought to be going crazy about that. And if we're a child of God, we're on the winning side. There's nothing, no weapon that has ever been formed can can prosper against us. We need to praise God today. So join me as we pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for loving us and taking care of us. And God, for just being who you are, Lord. And God, for just moving, Lord, as we, as Katie's testimony, Lord, when, when a heart begins to seek your way, Father, you begin to make a way. And I thank you for that. Just help us, God, to, to realize that there's nothing too big for you. God, there's nothing too big for our God. And Father, we pray today for all of our sick, for those that are struggling with their health, Lord. We realize that these bodies decay, these bodies, God, they, they wear out. But there's coming a day when we get that new and glorified body that uh, God will just praise you and rejoice forevermore. And we praise you for that. And God, I ask today that if there's one among us that does not know you, that today would be the day, whether they're here in person, whether they're out on the live stream, wherever they may be, Lord God, if they don't know you in a personal way as their Lord and Savior, that today would be the day that they would come into the family, take up their cross, deny themselves, and follow you. Father, we love you and we praise you. We ask, Lord, that you would just prepare our hearts for worship, that we lay aside the things of this world and praise you. For you and you alone are worthy. And all of these things we had asked in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning. Ooh, that was good. Y'all will stand with me this morning. We'll go and get started. We're going to start with hymn number 217, which is Holy Ground. These two lovely young ladies are going to help me out this morning. to um, something that is not in our hymnal. It's Living Hope. If you were here with us um, on Sunday night, um, the pastor's family, the Whitehead family, actually sang this song. And incidentally, Angela and I had already chosen this song for Sunday morning. So you got a taste of it last um, Sunday night, and you're going to get it again this morning. So it's Living Hope.
as we continue singing, we'll go back to our hymnal. This is hymn number 618. And this is in his presence.
Amen. Another in the fire. You know, it's been a good place to be this morning. Thank the Lord for what He has done, what He continues to do. And uh, as I was sitting there thinking about it and, and uh, all these young ladies stepping up and stepping out and, and doing all this uh, out there, you know, from uh, uh, Katie and Thrift for Kenya, the, the young ladies up here singing, uh, and you're a part of that, uh, Laura, part of the young ladies. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, yeah, and I, I, but I was thinking, you know, young men, we uh, step up. It's time. It's time that, uh, you know, I thank the Lord for what I see in the church, what I see, the, the move. I, I, I see uh, the, the young people not saying this is going to be our church someday, saying we're a part of the church today. Today. And stepping out and, step, and doing the things, and, and it uh, gives me hope. Uh, church, you know, when we look around the world today, it's hard to find hope, isn't it? Uh, but when you look and see what God is actually doing, uh, there should be hope. Uh, and our hope is not uh, in the things of this world. Our hope is in Christ Jesus. And I, I praise the Lord for what He has done and, and what He continues to do. And if you have your Bibles, and I certainly pray that you do, let's turn to the 13th chapter of the book of Acts, verse 38 through 52. And, uh, uh, and, and I do ask you just to... Uh, pray much that I could give you exactly what God has given me. Last night as I was laying in bed and I was laying there and uh, Scripture was going through my mind and, and through my heart and, and, and I was thinking, you know, God, are you trying to change the direction you want me to go? But uh, And actually he was just kind of adding to that. So uh, I'll, after I read this Scripture, and I'm going to tell Katie now so uh, she'll be have a heads up, then we want to turn to John 3 uh, and start about verse... 14 or so and read through a little ways there uh, and tie these two together because the reason that, that Paul and Barnabas uh, had such power and the reason that Paul and Barnabas had such peace and we're going to see that Paul and Barnabas were in a place here and they had stepped out and they were traveling and doing the work that God had called them to do and they had come uh, to a, a region that was predominantly uh, um, it, it wasn't, a, a, there were some Jews there, but it wasn't a predominant Jewish area, but they were in the synagogues and they had been invited uh, to speak on the Word of God after the reading uh, of the Word there. And when, after they did this, you know, God began to work. But I want you to understand, church, that even though sometimes things look like it, there's rejection and there's no hope and there's no help, uh, we're going to turn back over to John in the third chapter and make you and, and look and see and realize why uh, that these men, as they left this place, they left rejoicing, even though you would think that they would have left all depressed and downtrodden. But John or Acts 13 verses 38 through 52, and it says, "Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you." And by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe even if one tells it to you. And they went out and the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy, began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. 
And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region, but the Jews incited devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city started persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of the district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. And there, that very last verse, I want you to uh, see, it says, and the disciples were what? They were filled with joy uh, and with the Holy Spirit. And as I was uh, reading this and thinking about it and praying about all this, I thought, you know, in our world today, as we look around, there's not a whole lot of joy in the world, is there? Uh, there's not a whole lot, it seems like, to be excited about. Not a whole lot for the world to look and, and, and to say, well, uh, there, there's hope. But I want you to turn now over to John 3. And we're going to start about verse uh, uh, 15, uh, 14, I guess. So I'll start on verse 14 and read down through a, very, uh, for, through a few verses of Scripture, church. And I want you to understand why uh, that we should have hope. You know, Paul and Barnabas were there and they had been preaching Christ Jesus from the Old Testament. Uh, the people had desired to hear more about this. And, uh, but, you know, church, you make no mistake, any time that God begins to work, you know, I tell any young preacher, any young person that wants to go out and do missions, any older person that wants to do these things, that make no mistake, when you step out for Jesus, attacks will begin to come. Uh, when you step out and you begin to work, because uh, Satan doesn't have to attack those that are not doing anything. It's only those that are doing something for the Lord that Satan sees worthy to be attacked. Only those that are stepping out and trying to share the gospel. Paul and Barnabas were going into this region there uh, and they begin to preach Jesus Christ, uh, uh, the crucified and resurrected as the only hope of salvation. Uh, they begin to preach the fact that there was punishment for those that did not believe in Christ Jesus. Uh, and the people got angry and began to uh, incite it, you know, and as I was reading that, talking about it, inciting. What it, did it say? The prominent women, the uh, people of esteem, the people of authority, the people of influence. You know, I, it made me think about our world today. Uh, we've got people in our world today that are what? They're influencers. You know, Katie, as, as a lot of us, we don't understand all the new technology. She's talking about Instagram, you know. You talk about Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, and I think there's probably a dozen other places there. Uh, TikTok and, 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 you know, all, I don't know. I know some of the words. I don't know what they are. Uh, but as you look at these things, and then people, uh, they make their living by being influencers. They go out there and they get a brand. They get something and they go out and they start advertising, if you would, or marketing and doing these things. They're influencers. And we think, well, that's a new thing. What did it say here? It says, but the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city to stir up persecution against Paul and Barnabas to drive them out of the district. We need to understand that these things are happening and occurring today. And you would think, boy, after they rose up against them, that they would be so depressed and so downtrodden and so heartbroken that they would uh, just have turned and said, well, you know, we tried, Lord. Uh, we tried. They didn't want it. They didn't want to listen to it. They didn't want to hear it. But I believe that as Paul and Barnabas was doing these things, they were thinking about the Scriptures. They were thinking about the words of Christ Jesus Himself spoke back in John 3. Uh, church, and it ought to give us hope and it ought to give us encouragement to realize that it says that as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. What do we need to uh, look at? He said, if we just lift Him up, church, you know, what is our job? Uh, what was Paul and Barnabas's job in that day? Paul and Barnabas's job uh, wasn't to make them become converts. Uh, it was to lift up Jesus. It was to tell the world about Jesus. You know, what is our work here today uh, as a church and as a Christian people? It's to lift up Jesus. It's to glorify Jesus. 
Uh, it's to praise his glorious name uh, and to realize that when trouble comes, uh, uh, he said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you, that I'll be with you always. Uh, uh, it's to realize, church, that we have a God uh, that the Bible said is the same yesterday, today, uh, and forevermore. If he was the very same one that was there with Paul and Barnabas uh, when those people were incited against them and drove them out of there, how could they rejoice for the fact that they knew that, that, that the only reason that they were being driven out is because they had stirred Satan? Church, don't you think about that a little bit? You might say, well, Lord, why? Uh, why uh, uh, should we rejoice when we're persecuted there? The Bible says that we should rejoice uh, uh, when we're persecuted because it says uh, in 2 Timothy, uh, uh, it says that if we desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, uh, all who desire to live that godly life in Christ Jesus shall what? Shall suffer persecution. Church, uh, 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 suffering persecution for the cause of Christ. And uh, it's like one of the uh, uh, saints uh, said one time, we don't need to go out doing things looking for persecution, but when persecution comes because we have lifted up Jesus as Moses lifted up the, uh, the serpent in the wilderness, because persecution comes when we're lifting up Jesus, uh, uh, we should rejoice in knowing that uh, uh, church that we're making headway. We should rejoice in knowing that uh, uh, God is at work uh, and where God is at work, Satan's going to try his best to derail it. He's going to try his best to stop it. As I looked and I saw uh, the young people coming up here and taking their place, uh, I heard them singing the songs of Zion, I saw the pictures of uh, the works that's uh, being done in Kenya uh, because God laid on the heart of one of our young people something that needed to be done. Uh, I thought, you know, we should rejoice in these things. Why? Because God is at work. God is at work. Church, we need to realize in this world uh, today it looks like the, that it's hopeless, doesn't it? But God is at work. Uh, God is doing great and mighty things in this world. Uh, uh, God is, is saving lost people. Uh, and God did it. Why? Because of His great love toward us. Uh, we are His creation created in His likeness, in His image. Uh, uh, God told the Son, He said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness of everything that He created. One thing He created in His image. That's you. That's me. That's who He created. That's what He created in the image of Almighty God. Of all the things in the world uh, that He desired uh, fellowship with, what did He desire? Fellowship with you and fellowship with me. Church, we ought to rejoice uh, in the knowledge that the God of all creation desires fellowship with you, desires uh, that He have a place for you in glory. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come unto you to receive you unto myself, that where I am, what? There you may be also. Rejoice in the fact that we know that he did this for us. He said, for God so loved the world. Probably one of the verses that most all of us learned in vacation Bible school or Sunday school. But I want you to look at it here for a second and really look and see what he's saying. God so loved the world that he gave. Church, uh, uh, the, nobody went and got Jesus. Nobody had to uh, forcibly do this thing. It said that God gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have he learned eternal life for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. You know, church, so many times it seems like uh, that condemnation is what we all look at. Uh, uh, we all look at and we make judgments. And, and, I, and I have to tell you there, I'm guilty. I'm guilty. I look at people and I make judgments. I see situations and I make judgments. You know, I get dis, uh, discouraged and I make judgments. But what did Jesus come? The Bible said He didn't come to condemn. What did He come? He come that the world might be saved. Church, we don't need to go out there uh, and just... You know, I know we have to stand against things, uh, but you, what, you, what we also need to be doing is telling them what we stand for. What do we stand for? We stand for Jesus. Uh, uh, we stand for the saving grace that only comes uh, through a personal relationship with Christ Jesus. And He's still offering it today. 
He didn't come to condemn it. He come to save it. He come to save the world that the world through him might be saved. So whoever believes in him is not condemned. Church, think about that for a minute. If you believe in Christ Jesus, if you are a child of God, you are not condemned. Uh, uh, the world may look at you and the world may uh, uh, talk bad about you. You know, as they had devout women and men, leading men and women that were talking bad about Paul and Barnabas. They were making false accusations against Paul and Barnabas. They drove them out of the district by making these accusations. But they were not condemned in the sight of God. Church, who do we desire? Who do we desire to judge us? Or we desire the world to judge us or do we desire Jesus to judge us? The Bible says that it is once appointed unto man to die. And after this comes the judgment. We need to understand that, that judgment is coming. You know, Hebrews 9, 27 says, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. But aren't you glad that that same one that they were singing about, another in the fire, will be that one that in that day, if you're His child, if you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, if your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, if you've received that free gift of eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord, uh, in that day, uh, you will not, when you stand in judgment, you'll not stand alone. You'll not uh, uh, have to worry about uh, all the things of this world because what's going to happen on that day, the Father's going to look and says, that's mine. Uh, I died for Him. He accepted me as His Lord and Savior. Uh, uh, wasn't perfect didn't live uh, the life the way that he should every day, but he's mine. Hope today, church. What is our living hope? You know, I was just thinking as we was going through the music there, our living hope is in the fact that we're in his presence. In his presence. You're never alone. You're never without him. There's not a place you go. There's not a situation that you face that He's not right there with you, that He's not there every step of the way. The promise that we have. Paul and Barnabas, they could be, they could rejoice in the fact that even though they shook the dust off of their feet, because what did, he, did they say there? It said, they shook the dust off. Uh, read there, it says that they, these people, counted themselves unworthy. These men, these women, these people in the synagogue, these Jews that should have been the most rejoicing of all, but because of all of the things that God was doing because of the work in the 47th verse, it says, excuse me, the 46th verse, it says, and Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly saying, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. You know, I think about people that ask the question, why would Jesus send people to hell? What does the word say right here? It says, you judged yourself unworthy you thrust it aside. You rejected the Word of God. You rejected the call of Christ Jesus. You denied it. And, and I know sometimes we get caught up in, in, in missions, and, and I'm all, all about missions, and, and I've heard this uh, question a lot recently. You know, what about all those people in all these unreached nations and all these uh, places that haven't heard the gospel? Uh, and church, sometimes uh, I believe Satan gets us caught up in, uh, in chasing after those questions and chasing after those things uh, that we forget all about the people out here that we are supposed to be sharing the gospel with uh, so that they can make the the decision that they either follow Jesus or they thrust it aside. Uh, in church, it should never be uh, that the people we come in contact with uh, say, you never told me about Jesus. We need to give them the opportunity. We need to tell the world. We need to tell them about who Jesus is. For it says, 
For whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light came into the world and the people loved the darkness rather than the light because of their works were evil. Church, we look in our world uh, and why uh, did these uh, religious leaders come and rail against Paul and and Barnabas? Why did these religious leaders uh, begin to dispute the word of God that was coming from Paul's mouth? Uh, Because their works were evil uh, uh, and the light of God's word shows the evidence of the evil works of the life. Why is it that it seems like it is getting harder and harder and why the Word of God is is trying to be stopped in our nation and in places around the world? It's because God's Word shines light on the evil works of men. Why is it that nations that for a while were allowing borders to be open to allow the gospel to be preached freely, uh, when they begin to see uh, the, the men and women to come to Christ and begin to, their lives changed and begin their uh, evil deeds uh, uh, begin to be shown uh, uh, because of the light of the Word of God, begin to show the evilness of uh, the leadership, begin to show the evilness of the things that they were doing. Uh, uh, and what did they want? Instead of turning their lives over to Jesus... They wanted to shut out the light so they could continue to do their evil things in darkness. I had a young man at the jail ministry one time tell me, he said, you know why we do all the things we do after dark? He said, because if we really looked at what we were doing, if we really allowed the light of day to shine on the evil and the wickedness and and, and the, the ugliness of what we do, we'd have to think about it a little while. He said, it's much easier to do these terrible things in the dark than it is when you see the light of day. It's much evil, easy to be evil and to be wicked and to hurt and to harm people uh, when you don't see them than it is when you look them in the face and you see them. It's a, a much easier to live that life when you don't think that the people that you love and care about are seeing your evil deeds and seeing the things that you're doing. These men that were had evil deeds... Instead of embracing the Word of God, they've tried to run Paul and, and Barnabas out. And they left rejoicing. And, you know, and as I was thinking, church, you might say, well, preacher, you know, that, that's a hard thing. But I was reading some statistics. And church, we've got hard times coming. But you know, when the church has grown the most, when the gospel has grown the mo- most, in the times of greatest persecution, in the world today... The three regions of the world that the gospel of Christ Jesus, that Christianity is growing the fastest... Uh, is in a- Africa, South America, and in Asia. And you know by uh, Open Doors USA Ministry, the 50 most dangerous places in the world uh, to be a Christian, uh, every one of them fall in either Africa or Asia. The places that it's the most dangerous to be a child of God, it seems like is the place uh, that God's Word is prospering, that God's Word is growing, uh, uh, that the Word, that, that as uh, uh, Satan fights against it, God's Word is going going out stronger and greater. In church, we look in our country, we've made it pretty easy to be a child of God or to profess that being a child of God. We need to stand up and say, Lord, whatever it is we have to face, Lord, we're going to face it for you. Why? Because God so loved us that He sent Jesus. And Jesus didn't come to condemn us. And you know, sometimes it's easy to stand up here and, and uh, I've been told, you know, Pastor, you know, sometimes you get on a roll about things that, that are kind of negative. And, and we do sometimes. But when we look at the things, church, we have so much to be joyful for. We have so much to rejoice about. And as I came in this morning, I began to look and see the children come in the church. And I thought that's things to rejoice I saw some of our people that 
haven't been able to be here because of COVID concerns. The numbers have dropped uh, church and, and, and the people are starting to be able to come back. Uh, I see our young uh, ladies of the church and I know young men, y'all are going to do likewise. I know you're going to step up and do likewise. They begin to step up and they begin to feel spots and they begin to feel needs and uh, they begin to be leaders and begin to lead uh, in this thing. And I think church, you know, we've got a lot to praise God for. We've got a lot to rejoice about. And you know what it's all doing? It's lifting up Jesus. And what did he say? That if he would be lifted up, what would he do? We, we, we worry about our lost people. And we say, how are we going to get them in? Lift up Jesus. Live Jesus. Talk about Jesus. Show them Jesus. If we do these things, what will we do? We'll begin to see Jesus come into the hearts and to the lives. I was telling Katie earlier, I was reading an article this morning, and I'm going to tell this little story, and then I'm going to try to close. But there was a missionary couple and, and took their young family into a region in some African village that uh, is a, a Muslim village, a very devoutly, strongly Muslim village. And they came in and uh, they said that anywhere that they went, if, if they were seen carrying a Bible, people started throwing rocks at them. They began to threaten them. They began to shun them and begin to tell them, we don't want you here. We don't want your kind in our uh, village. Uh, we want you to leave. They, they wouldn't uh, allow them to speak to them. They wouldn't allow them to have part in anything in the village. And, uh, and uh, they said it, it had been that this Muslim population had dro uh, drove out every missionary that had come. Uh, but this man and this woman, they said, but we couldn't leave, that God wouldn't allow us to leave. And he told us uh, that this is where you need to be. You need to be uh, steady fast you need to show my love and they partnered with another ministry in something as simple as they brought in chickens and seeds and farming equipment and this family they began to raise chickens and begin to give them to people and they begin to raise produce and give it to people. And they begin to help others that wanted to do that and, and, and got supplies in and begin to p build chicken lots and begin to uh, get chickens come in and got to, uh, farming equipment. And when the people began to see that, uh, it took four years before they had the first convert. Four years. And as of now, they have one family that has come to Christ but they said every bit of the persecution, every bit of the trials, every bit of the rocks being thrown, every bit of the threats being made was worth it if they've only were able to reach that one family. But they said that they know that by the grace of God, they'll reach more. Because God has said this is where you need to be. This is where you need to work. This is where my name needs to be proclaimed. In church, by whatever means that God leads us to, and whatever means that God gives us opportunity, we need to be steadfast. We're living in, in hard times in our country. But church, it's not been four years since we've seen somebody come to Christ. When you walk out the door carrying this book in your arm, there's nobody out there throwing rocks at you. We need to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the works of the Lord, always sharing the love of Christ Jesus. For if we be not weary in well-doing, it may be four years. That person that you're witnessing to today... Because I know some of you all have told me you've, you've been talking to people and, and, and I know some of you have gone and, and asked them, can I just read scripture to you? Some of them uh, you're inviting to church and you're inviting to our events and you're inviting. And, uh, but church, be not weary in well-doing because in due season... Uh, you will reap the rewards if we faint not. Uh, uh, in due season, we'll see the work of God uh, come uh, and, and begin to bear fruit if we'll not give up. We've got a lot to be praising God for. We've got a lot to glorify Him for. We've got to, a lot to lift up our hands.
for these hands were what? They were made to, holy hands were made to work for you. Church, it's, I praise God today for what He's doing. As Brenda can tell you, I, I have gone through a period where I was just like, God, you know what's going on? Lord, it seems like the world is going crazy. Uh, I had to get off of social media and off of uh, the news networks for a while. But when I did that, I began to replace it with more and more of this and re reading more and more encouraging things. Church, God's doing great works in this world. He's still in control. He's still saving lost souls. He's still lifting people up in our communities. He's still healing sick. He's still opening blinded eyes. He's still doing things that can only be attributed to the fact that it's God that's doing them. We need to rejoice. We need to praise Him and worship Him. If you'll come and get us a song, the Lord's about done with us. I pray today that, that you rejoice in the Lord, that you leave this place realizing that we've got a lot to rejoice about. Are you saved? Two of you. Are you saved? There you go. Do you need any more to rejoice about? Do you know who is taking care of every need that you have? He said He would supply our needs according to His riches and glory. Now, He didn't say, I'll give you that new uh, Mercedes. He didn't say, I'd give you that new bass boat. He said, I'll supply your needs. He supplies our needs, church. He, Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. What did He say for us to do? Share my gospel. Love my people. Do the works that I've called you to do. Rejoice. You know, it, it, today I, I look at it in church. When we leave this place, if you can't say anything else, but if you're a child of God, you should leave here rejoicing and say, what a great, great God we served. Because did you deserve salvation? I didn't. I didn't. Was I good enough? Never have, never will be of myself. But I'm so thankful for that when that day comes, there's a song that Brenda used to sing. In the words of it says that when he sees me, he sees the blood of the Lamb. He sees me as worthy and not as I am. We ought to rejoice for that. That he doesn't look and see those thoughts of condemnation that we have. Those thoughts of, of anger and of worry and, and so many things that, that as a child of God we've got no right, no reason to be doing. But He sees us as worthy. And why are we worthy? Because He is worthy. And we've been adopted and we've been bought and we've been washed by the blood of the Lamb. While we stand and sing a verse of a song, if you need to pray today, if you don't have a reason to rejoice, you need to come to this altar. Because as I said, if you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, you've got a reason to rejoice. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I, I beg you, please, don't leave this place without Him today. If you don't know Jesus, I beg you, if you're out there on Facebook, YouTube, wherever, humble yourselves right now. Surrender your lives to Jesus. The Bible says, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. He said that we deny ourselves, turn from the things of this world, and take up our cross and follow Him. Humble yourself before Jesus and begin to follow Jesus. Church, it's not just sign a thing and say, I'm a Christian, I've got my ticket, I'm ready to go. But it's a Lord, I'm beginning this journey with you. And He'll walk every step of the way with us. We'll have that one more, that one in the fire with us. That one in that battle with us. That no matter what comes, He'll never leave us. While we sing, if you need to pray, won't you come? Hymn 479. <laughs>
It's been a good place to be today. Thank the Lord for feeling His presence for each and every one of you. Church, we love you. Thank the Lord for you. Thank the Lord for all the cards, the prayers, the gifts, the poster, everything for pastor appreciation. You know, it feels like that we ought to be giving you the gifts for allowing us to be a part of this church, allowing us to be here, and we thank the Lord for you. Do be much in prayer. Pray for our services tonight, discipleship class at 4.30, worship service at 6. Um, your discipleship classes during the week. Next week will be, I guess, what, food pantry Saturday morning, then uh, the uh, trunk or treat Saturday evening. Be much in prayer for these come out. Let's use it as a time to reach out, to minister, to, uh, to just let the community know that we love them and care about them. Anyone have a testimony, announcement, anything at all before we dismiss? All minds and hearts clear? Youth choir, right afterwards. So be sure and come up. And help them out. Uh, be a part of it. And uh, I do appreciate the young ladies for stepping out and being so willing to help uh, in the singing and in all, it's just it's such a blessing to see them up there and see them step out and do it. Um, it's a just praise the Lord for it. You know, God has got to, He's in control. All minds and hearts clear. Brother Chris, would you dismiss us, please? Jesus.